Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another episode of World of Tanks with me, Get Bag. Now I know it's been a long time since I did an episode of World of Tanks with Get Bag, but yeah, I thought any time is as good as any really. And I have just moved to university from home, which means that getting up videos frequently may be a bit of a challenge, but I'm going to try and do some now and again. So, you know, keep an eye out on this channel if you like World well, of Tanks videos, or you just like listening to the sound of my gorgeous voice. But today we're going to be taking a look at a tank that I don't think many people do talk about in World of Tanks. That it, well, it's mainly reason because it's not actually very good. I mean, both in the game and in real life. It's the Tier 4 French heavy tank, the B1 Char Bis. This tank is, well, shit. I mean, if you like this tank, please seek help because it's really, really bad. Like, it's a tier 4 tank, but its top tier gun is a tier 3 gun. I mean, really, if you like this tank, you don't know what a good heavy tank is, really. I mean, if, if, you know, just, 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 just sort yourself out, for real. But the B1 is an interesting vehicle, at least in the real world. In World of Tanks, it's like kind of your substandard tier 4 heavy tank. Most tier 4 heavy tanks in the game aren't that good. I think, in fact, there's probably only like two of them, the B1 and uh, the German tier 4 heavy tank, and neither of them are really that good, although the German one does have a better gun. The B1 has better armour, and is also... And it's not that unmaneuverable for a tier four tank either. It's got like a, you know, it's got it's got like equal tier tra um, tra uh, tracks and uh, engine. I mean, its top tracks has twenty eight degrees of um, of um, twenty eight degrees per second. So you know that's not too bad. And its load limit is thirty nine point three tons, which is an increase of six tons above the default tracks and then its top engine has 350 horsepower which for a heavy tank at this day isn't too bad um, its hit points are 420 if you give it the uh, upgraded B1 APX4 turret which has armour of 46 millimeters all the way around traverses at 30 degrees per second and has a view range of 330 meters so yeah this thing does not have great view range but then again tier 4 heavy tank what do you expect so yeah, 420 hit points between 29 and a half and 39 weight load limit of tons. Uh, 350 horsepower. Top speed is around 30 kilometers an hour. Traverse speed 28 degrees per second. Hull armor is 60 on the front and side, so it is actually quite heavily armored for a uh, tank of its tier. But and it's rear armour is also like 55 millimetres so that's actually quite good, that's better even than some like uh, tier 6 heavy medium tanks and um, I think there's even a couple of tier 6 heavy tanks that don't have that good f rear armour, so it's not bad armoured for a tank of its tier but it's just like the armour isn't particularly well designed uh, standard shell damage with the top 47 millimetre gun is 41 to 69 so it's not very powerful Penetration isn't too bad, 50 to 83 with standard AP ammo and um, 74 to 123 millimetres of penetration with the premium APCR. And the good main good thing about the gun is its rate of fire of 28.57 rounds per minute. That is pretty vicious, but again, the gun isn't that powerful, so be prepared to pack some APCR. Not a load, not a huge amount, I've only packed like 15, but some. Uh, turret traverse 30, view range 330 with the top turret, and signal range with the top radio is 360. So it's kind of a standard tank, really. Not particularly quick, but not particularly slow, and r at least respectably maneuverable. Shitty gun, really, but with good uh, rate of fire. Not bad hit points, good armor. So it's not bad. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't enjoy much great success or fame in World of Tanks, and in real life it was pretty much a failure, to be honest. I mean, we'll go about 
into that in a bit, but in the meantime, let's find ourselves a game. And here we are, in the first match with the B1. Now, the B1 was designed for quite a long time in the real world. It was designed between 1921 and 1934, so it was designed for 13 years. And the idea for it actually was proposed in 1919 by General, by General Jean-Baptiste Eugène Estienne of the French Army for a heavier armoured vi fighting vehicle that would be able to carry bigger and stronger assaults than the other French tanks that were in service at that time, such as the tanks that were designed for the basis of the British Mark 1 to 5 tanks and the, the, the quite revolutionary, in fact, French FT-17 light tank, which was the first tank of a... Uh, its type to, uh, you know, have the turret mounted on the front. But yeah, the B1 was designed to carry the day march alongside the infantry, whereas, you know, tanks like uh, the uh, British cruisers would be the main striking arm of the Allied armoured forces in the early Second World War. But unfortunately, British tanks and French tanks, for that matter, in the first sort of couple of years of the Second World War, were well shit. They were really bad. And the B1 was no exception, really. It was. It benefited from having a small crew. It tended to have stronger armour than most German tanks could deal with at the time in the first couple of years of the war. But that didn't mean it was particularly good to have a small crew, which, meant, which was good in the sense that you didn't have to train large crews or train many crews to uh, operate this machine. But at the same time, that also meant that if one crew member got injured in battle, then the for his role, like, there, there wasn't a very flexible machine in that sense. I'm just going to load APCR to deal with this AMX-14. Shit all. And now my APCR is doing something. Yeah, that's another tank that has great armor. That's French and low tier. It's the MX-14. Low tier tank that has heavy armor to go for that. But yeah, I just got insta killed by that Stug 3B, which you know, good to hear. My kind of should be standing out there in the open. But yeah, we'll um, we'll spectate the other B1 on our team for a bit. But yeah, the B1 was originally proposed in 1919, but it wasn't design fully designed until 1934. And between 1934 and um, 1940, which was the time in which it was uh, produced and built, the French built uh, 405 of these machines, which isn't really that much. I mean, another sort of somewhat unremarkable tier 4 tank in World of Tanks is the Russian T-28 medium tank, which only had like 503 of that built in its lifetime. And yeah, the B1 was no different. Not many models built, not many variations even, only like three, and between those variations there wasn't much difference apart from like the gun that was used and maybe the transmission. It wasn't a very remarkable tank in most senses of the world, but it was quite imposing to the Germans in the early days of the war in the sense that they didn't actually have that many weapons that could deal with its armour apart from maybe their 88mm anti-aircraft guns and their air force. Their guns, even the 50mm high velocity gun on the Panzer III, wasn't really able to punch through its armour. And that was the main uh, benefit of the B1, is that it had good armour. And also, while its main 37mm gun on the top of the tank in the turret wasn't particularly powerful, it did have, as you can see in the front there, a 75mm howitzer, which could you know, prove a great benefit to infantry assaulting an enemy position. Now that game was a bit of a crap one, but... So here we are again in another match of the B1. 
And this is kind of like the worst matchmaking we've seen yet, like tier 5 or something on the team. Um, the last match we were in was kind of like the most favourable, you know, a handful of tier 4s at the top of the team and a smattering of tier 3s as well. Maybe from a couple of tier 2s. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, I probably won't do that well in this match because I'm going to be pretty heavily outgunned in that match. And even by that uh, Churchill tier 3 Russian premium tier 5 heavy tank on the enemy team. That thing hasn't got a great gun, but it can punch from my mind pretty easily, I'd say. Um, but yeah, we're on Bloomberg and we're in a tier 4 and 5 match with uh, like three tier 3s at the bottom of either team. But yeah, the B1 was ostensibly designed as a breakthrough tank. It had the same kind of track design as most sort of early tanks that the British designed at the bit at during the middle of World War One, so you know it was good for going across fields, breaking through trenches, and driving onwards. And it had a relatively okay speed for a tank of its weight, so you know it was kind of expected that you know there would be any need for any improvement on that. And as a result, when faster tanks came into production, the French didn't really improve on the B1 much other in terms of its gun or its. Uh, transmission or anything of the sort. So, the French kind of got themselves into a bit of a lapse and became quite lax in their tank design, much like the British actually, between the First and Second Wars, Wars, which meant that the Germans, of course, built much stronger and better tanks. But, of course, as I said before, many German guns were actually able to penetrate the armour of the B-1 when they first encountered it. This was quite imposing to the German army, at least in terms of its armour and size. Many German tanks were still faster than this machine, and the Germans still had their Air Force and their 88mm AA guns, which could just kind of pulverise the B1 to scratch. Ils ont fait votre fait. Je lis HS. On peut plus bouger. On n'a pas pénétré le blindage. So yeah, it, you know, the B1 wasn't too lucky. Then again, neither were the German Panzer III crews when they first came across this thing. I mean, they were sort of like, oh dear god, of our 50mm guns that devastated tanks throughout the Low Countries and Poland are just useless against this thing. Not entirely this in mean, most of the cases when the Germans won outright, but for the most part they did have to use the uh, Air Force or their 80mm guns to destroy the B1s. Which were for the most part able to deflect the fire of most German anti-tank weapons. struggling against that Churchill 3, but then again, it's not really designed for higher tier uh, tank warfare, and kind of in real life it was more designed as an infantry tank to help the infantry punch through trench lines, and that was kind of like out of, born out of the mentality of generals who had survived the First World War, who believed that trench warfare was the word of the day, the trench warfare would continue to be the prominent feature of warfare in Europe in the upcoming conflict that started in 1939 as it had been in the First World War. Uh, but of course they were proven wrong when all the German tanks proved to have lighter armor, more higher penetration guns and much better engines, meaning that they can outflank and push past British and French tank formations very quickly. So the B1 didn't enjoy much success and on top of that it was a bitch to mechanically maintain. Hence the reason why many French crews just downright hated driving, despite the fact that they had good armour and admittedly not bad guns. So its main 37mm gun wasn't you know, particularly excellent. 
was still capable of punching through the armor for the tanks, but yeah, I mean the B1 wasn't as successful when we first encountered the enemy. Nor was I in this match. So yeah, the last match wasn't too hot. But then again, what can you say? The French tier four vehicles aren't usually known for their successes. Especially the French tier four tank destroyer that sounds and that thing is literally one of the most useless machines I've ever driven in this game. But, as I was saying, the B1 did have some serious design flaws that really limited its strategic levels and battle capabilities. For example, it guzzled up a lot of fuel, which meant it had to be refilled in a lot, and that meant its strategic mobility and range was severely limited, and as a result, the Chasseur divisions that were equipped with it in the French army were deployed mainly as reserve units. And, you know, as a result of the realisation in the late 30s, as it became clear that the main enemy of the Second World War of France was going to be Germany, the French realised far too late that they were going to, of course, have to fight German tanks. And, of course, the German tanks were well designed, which meant that the B1 would have to go into combat against other tanks. And did it have a good gun? It only had a 37mm gun, which wasn't entirely reliable. So the French stuck a 75mm howitzer into the hull, which did kind of help when attacking uh, armoured positions and infantry units, but for the most part, didn't do much for it. And as a result, the B1 was never much improved upon because the French had been so lax in their tank design. And you can see that happening with other French tanks and also British tanks, such as the Crusader, Matilda, and other things, which were designed for a uh, trench warfare more than uh, the mobile warfare that we saw play out in the Second World War. Hence the reason why so many British tanks were designed as either infantry tanks for breaking through trenches or as cruiser tanks for exploiting the gaps in trenches. The same goes for the French as well, although the French tanks usually weren't as quick. Um, even the B1 wasn't necessarily that fast, even though it was like at top speed of about 30 knots. Which isn't too bad for a tank of this way. Yeah, you know, even the smile was that good. However, as I said before, the main strength of it was its armour. I, during one battle in 1940, during the Battle of France, the legendary German general Heinz Guderian commented that even despite the use of all the different anti-tank weapons that he and his unit had at their disposal, 50mm tank guns, 47 and 20, 47 mm anti-tank guns, 37 mm anti-tank guns, 20mm flak guns, they were barely able to make even the slightest scratch in the armour of the B-1. And he said that because of this, the French were know, able to hold off his unit and that his troops were really spared as the day went on because they were barely able to do sod all against the beam. And that also came about because of the tiny turret placed on top of the B1. And many see this as the B1's greatest flaw, the fact that it had a tiny turret that the commander had barely anywhere to look, move, go. And because of this, of course, the gun wasn't very big because there wasn't a big turret to fit it into. That's the reason why there was only a 37mm gun and not, say, a 47mm gun or a 50mm gun fitted into the B1 as its main arm. But then again, this also had added benefits. They weren't very clear at first, but over time they did manage, They did begin to tell, and the Germans began to notice them as well when they went into their the battles against the B1 in 1940. And the French did favour at small turrets, despite the shortcomings that they came with. They allowed for a much smaller of vehicles, and although you know French expenditure on tanks was a lot more than the Germans, they actually kind of lacked the production capacity to build loads and loads of heavy tanks, which, to be fair, the Germans were in the same 
manner at the beginning of the war as well. And hence the reason why he had such a small turret. And also because the B1 had, of course, originally been designed as a infantry support tank to support breakthroughs in the line. Exploit, you know, weaknesses in certain points in the enemy trenches and to help the infantry to punch through. This is why it failed hard when it went up against enemy vehicles, especially in the Tank 3. Just spectate our B1, the other B1 on our team, as I've died now. And yeah, even at lower tiers, the B1 takes dust. And you can see this poor bastard here struggling as much as he can to do even the minusculest bit of damage. Or is minusculest even a word? I don't think it will. But, therefore, the, um, the B1 wasn't particularly effective against German units. Although there was, again, uh, again, a few instances where the B1 did enjoy some success, although they were very individual and their tactical significance overall wasn't very great. For example, there was one uh, incident where a B1 was sent into battle against the Germans on the 16th of May. A B1 called Ire by Captain uh, Pierre Bielet, which frontally attacked and smashed up 13 German tanks, all of them Panzer 3s and 4s, in the course of a few minutes, and it was able to return safely to French lines despite being hit 140 times. And this just shows that, like the incident with Heinz Guderian, that the B1 was able to hold its own. Although only to a limited extent, mainly because of its mechanical failures, the fact that there weren't very many of them, the fact that it wasn't as quick as many German tanks, and the fact that the French military command, particularly with the tanks, wasn't very good. The French leadership during the early years of the World War was known for staggering amounts of naivety and uh, amateur leadership just as much as the British, really. Um, which is a large reason why the British and the French absolutely got their asses kicked during the first years of the Second World War. Ironically enough, the area in which the B-1 probably saw its most significant successes was in German service, uh, not in the service of the French. The French used the B-1 as a breakthrough tank, equipped to elite chasseur divisions, but it wasn't really fast enough for them to use, and it was mechanically unreliable, and they basically got their asses handed them to. Though that wasn't, of course, the entire of the B-1. Again, a large part of the blame was placed, very rightly so, on the hands of the French and British High Command. Um, but the B-1 did enjoy a quite a considerable amount of success in German service. Many B-1s were pressed into second line of training services under the name of the Panzerkampfwagen B-2 750, 740 sorry, F uh, to train up second line and reserve German tank units, and 60 became platforms for flamethrowers such as the Fly Flammwagen of Panzerkampfwagen B2F, and uh, 16 were also converted into artillery platforms for the 105mm German artillery gun that was so prevalent for German blitzkrieg tactics throughout the years of the war. So the B-1 did see a lot of action in German service, and the Germans did use the B-1 quite a bit, in particularly in it's their, their invasions of the Balkan countries, the initial assault on the Soviet Union. You know, the fall of France wasn't the final time that the B-1 was used, and 
The B-1 was also deployed to some quite obscure parts of the war. For example, there was a German unit, the Panzer Auglinton 213, which was equipped with B-1 units that was uh, positioned in the Channel Islands, which is the only uh, British home territory invaded by the Germans during the Second World War. And they were used in the as a uh, guard for the Channel Islands. And I suppose to a degree that B1 did see much more success in the Germans than the French. As a modified assault unit rather than a heavy duty assault tank. Uh, it kind of depends on how the assault is. And the B1 in French service just simply wasn't used very effectively. And as you can see there, it was very vulnerable to our artillery as I just got fucked over by the enemy AMX 13AM. But. Fortunately enough, the B1, perhaps nowadays, is remembered more for the um, more for the successes that it saw in the war, uh, because there are much more accounts nowadays of how the B1 did enjoy success, such as in that engagement I mentioned earlier against Heinz Guderian, or the engagement in which one B1 destroyed 13 Panzers or in German service, and perhaps maybe the French should have saw the flaws of the B1 and redesignated it as a training vehicle or a backup vehicle, but then again, as I mentioned before, they didn't realise that until far too late into the 30s when tank design quickly came out shadowed in France by tank design in Germany. You can still see the B1. Um, there's uh, actually one preserved in the Tank Museum in Bovington uh, in the UK, which actually used to belong to the unit that guarded the Channel Islands, the Panzer Panzer Ablington 213, um, which the unit of which was actually deployed to the Channel Islands from 1941 to 1945. And that particular tank did indeed um, participate in the Balkan campaigns, the Eastern Front, and initially during Operation Barbarossa. Uh, the Germans particularly enjoyed quite a bit of success with the version of the B-1 that they equipped with a flamethrower, which enjoyed a lot of success in Russia, although its impact wasn't that great because they only had about 60 of those. But Overall, the B-1's impact on history, particularly in terms of tank warfare, is pretty minimal. Unlike the KB-1 here, it didn't have any other redeeming features apart from its armour. The KV-1 here, at least, had a good gun and a respectable mechanical reliability to keep it going. The B-1 didn't. However, it did enjoy some success, and it did show how tank design could be improved. It prompted the Germans to create much more powerful vehicles and it showed the French the flaws in the kind of heavy tanks they were designing. Hence the reason why they eventually designed the ARL 44, which is the tier 6 French tank, heavy tank in this game. And in a way, I guess you could say it also influenced the British in part to design much more heavily armed and armoured infantry tanks, hence the reason why the British ended up designing the Churchill heavy tank line. And also, in a way, I guess, to the British and the French to differentiate more between cruising tanks and infantry tanks, and more and more emphasise upon heavy tanks as an individual sort of uh, category within armoured warfare in of itself. And that's where the flaws really of the B1 come from. It wasn't designed to be a tank to tank vehicle. It was designed to be a tank against infantry vehicle, designed to punch through enemy lines and help the infantry move forwards. And 
because of that its range wasn't very great and its design was pretty sucky. But if there's one thing you can take away from this video, it's that the B1 was well armed and its impact as sort of a second line vehicle was pretty respectable. Um, if you actually want to get the B1 on World of Tanks, I really, really, really wouldn't recommend it. But it's not as bad as, say, some of the other Tier 4 French vehicles. I mean, the South 40 tank destroyer is abominable. And the Tier 4 RT of the French isn't too bad. The AMX 40 Tier French light tank isn't particularly great, but. Then again, it has got almost as good armour as the B1. But really, you could do much worse at tier 4 than the B1. Anyway, this has been Gitbag on the World of Tanks. And I'm sorry if I went a bit rambly in this video, but uh, hopefully I should be able to do more videos in the future. And again, I apologise for not having done them in such a long time. But again, until next time, I apologise. And I'll see you next time guys on the battlefield. Have fun and take care.